uh, I usually have a disclosure slide that says that I have no disclosures, and uh, it is actually quite interesting, and this is the first time I have to have disclosures. So um, my usual slide will be the one on the bottom, which is as a researcher in the care unit, I don't have any financial relations. The care unit does not take any for-profit funding, has not taken any for-profit funding for its work since its inception. Um, I'm a clinician at the Mayo Clinic, but I don't speak for the Mayo Clinic. Um, and I chair the board of the Patient Revolution, which is a nonprofit organization. And uh, this uh, book that I'm going to mention briefly today, uh, the proceeds of that book uh, fund that organization. Um, the uh, director of the organization is with us today, and it's Maggie over there, Maggie Breslin, uh, who directs that. Um, if you want to learn more about the organization and the book, uh, patientrevolution.org slash revolt is where you can go and learn more about it. Um, and uh, as often happens after all these conversations, there will be things to say and things to discuss, and there are a number of ways here on this slide to do that, either through Twitter or through uh, email. And notice that again, I'm putting the email of the patient revolution, not the email of Mayo, to try to bring a distinction here between these two activities that I do, which is hard to do, and again, it's the first time that I'm trying to draw that distinction, I'm not sure how effective that is. Um, the, um, the main point um, of, of, of the work that we all try to do, and I think the, the main challenge of the two days is that there's so much, right? I've heard from several of you, there's so much, I'll have to think about what is it that I'm going to try to do, and, and maybe you feel that you're not in a position to make a big change, that you're in a position to make a small change, a small, and you're trying to think, or figure out what are you going to bring back and so forth. And we've been doing this work of small change and small, uh, small impact uh, for, an, for a decade or more. And, and this book comes from the realization that the problem is really enormous and that, that, that all these small changes, perhaps that's all we can do. And if we all do it, perhaps we can make a big enough change. But boy, somebody needs to make the big change too. And the, the, the big problem, it, it, the, I'm going to frame the big problem as, as, as the fact that healthcare has become a, a, a very large economic sector. It's an industry. And um, it's a problem because as, as a large economic sector, it has, it has grown to be about the business of healthcare. And the, the language of the business of healthcare has infected um, everything that we do. And there's a, there's a thesis behind the proposition here, which is that language modifies the way we think. So not just that the way we think is reflected by our language, but the way we talk about problems change or affects the way we think about them and the way we go about solving them or addressing them. And so if we basically use the language of business to address the problems of care, we're going to think of the problems of care as problems of business. And that creates an interesting challenge for us because it, it, it drifts healthcare away from the problem of taking care of people into the problem of delivering healthcare, which is a completely different business. And so care, in quotes, is then a product that providers deliver. And you've heard a few of us talk about providers. You know, we should be talking about clinicians, you know, people that have the, the, the privilege of being at the bedside of those who suffer. Um, but no, we are providers for this industry, and we deliver care as if we were delivering packages uh, off the shelf to people, standardized packages. And uh, clinicians, uh, providers, and patients are actually both employees of this system. We work in, on the floor of the factory creating these packages of care. We co-create these packages of care. In fact, when patients are not activated to help us create these packages of care, we have a problem. Um, and so they have to show up to work at the factory, and we need to create care together. And then we show this package of care that we are co-creating with patients to payers and investors and say, is this good enough? And is this good quality? Are you willing to pay for this? And then they decide to what extent they're willing to pay for that. And our job, therefore, is to create value, is to provide the best possible package of care for the lowest cost so that these payers will be satisfied. None of this sounds like we all sign up for. And so at the end of the day, our job is to make sure that this package of care is well documented to be of high quality and low cost. It should be of high value. The result is that we end up delivering these packages of care that are standardized for patients like this. And you've heard during this, 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 this couple of days a number of instances in which it's been helpful to distinguish care for people like this to the care 
from the care to, for this person. And I think that's an essential distinction between healthcare as an industry and patient care. This has interesting effects, poisonous effects on the soul of clinicians. So clinicians, I think, derive very little meaning from providing care for patients like this. You know, perfect adherence to guidelines and optimal quality scores just don't, uh, are, don't seem enough when we know that one in two or one in three clinicians are experiencing symptoms of dehumanization, depersonalization, and low empathy, which is often summarized as, not as professional abuse, but as burnout. And the in the, if you look at the consultations, a proportion of the time is invested in the agenda of the healthcare system and on documentation and billing, leaving very little uh, of time for the patient's agenda. Incentives and, pro and incentives for productivity uh, become very commonplace in our industry. Incentives are strategies that somebody with power to determine what should be delivered uh, uses to ensure that that is what is delivered, indicating very clearly that those at the front line are not those with the power, but in fact those who should, must comply. And without the incentives, often financial incentives, without the carrots and the sticks, these people cannot provide the care that the payers or the investors are expecting from this healthcare system. Uh, this reduces the amount of, um, of power and initiative that those at the front lines uh, should have. Um, and the accountability and the value creation flow away from the, health, from the point of care uh, into uh, the, um, the, the boardroom. When patients receive the same care regardless of who they are, regardless of what they value, it doesn't matter who they are. And so we can, uh, it's all right to accelerate the machine and begin to see patients as a blur, Not, you know, as opposed to see them in high definition, as opposed to fully appreciate their biology and their biography. You know, Casey has told us that with the ICANN tool, we should be able to see those and, and, and make them work together. Uh, we can't, it doesn't really matter if we're gonna provide the same care to everyone. Um, the problems of under and over testing and under and over treatment, of course, are a problem when you try to distinguish what is the right amount of testing and what's the right amount of treatment for each person. But if all people are coming through, some people are going to get over or under testing and under and over treatment, you know, depending on what their needs are. But since we're going to treat them all the same way, we're only going to find out when we analyze at the individual level. In other words, some people are going to get good care, but it's almost going to be by accident. And some people are going to get cruelty by a system that is just unaware of how it would inflict it. And examples of, the, of this will be the situation where a patient is asked to um, uh, uh, renew a prescription. And the pharmacy has a policy that you have to renew the prescription within 10 days of the pill, com uh, you know, uh, uh, the pill, the pill count uh, uh, coming to an end. And the patient remembers to call in for a refill on day 11. And this is almost like a stress test to the kindness of the system. You know, you call in on day 11, and the pharmacy should say, I'll, I'll take, take your name down, and I will process it tomorrow. Boom, problem solved. But what we tend to say is, no, it's day 11. You should call within 10 days. Call again tomorrow. Goodbye. And the patient has to remember if they don't remember, if they forget. If they only remember the next time you come and see it, they'll, they'll tell you that they, they don't have the outcomes they were expecting because they, they, they have a missed number of days because of their pills. Um, things like this were... I, I, when I trained in Peru, um, you had to bring, you draw your blood from all your patients and then you bring all your samples to the lab. But if you came in one minute late, or the, the, the right amount, it was not exactly what it would be. The samples would be thrown away and you'd be asked to go back and sample the patient again. While that may increase the quality of the lab, it was unnecessarily cruel. And as a result of the fact that we have to produce more with less, we transfer work to the patients. And again, the patients are not there to take, pick up, patients and caregivers are not there to pick up the work. We will label them as non-compliant, another form of cruelty. Because once you label someone as non-compliant, that's how we're going to report those patients. Clinicians will report that patient to other clinicians. I have a 65-year-old woman. She's a non-compliant patient. Boom, it's a scarlet letter. Nobody's going to be able to help this person ever again. I would put forward that the, the number one reason, it's not the, it's not the only reason, but the number one reason the system is geared to do this is greed. And patients are trapped in this, in this greed uh, situation in, in two ways, through seduction and through frustration. 
If you're selling product, if you're selling new treatments, you have a robot, you have a proton beam facility, you have, you have wonderful new devices and treatments, you're going to seduce the patient into recognizing that they need these things. They must get state-of-the-art treatments and, and tests, and they will be fantastic. Their lives will be transformed. But then, whoever's paying the bill, the payers, the insurance companies, are going, to, are going to frustrate those patients by saying, no, 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 that's not for you. you. These are the hoops you have to jump. There are pre-authorizations. We're not going to pay for this. So on the one hand, you have direct-to-consumer advertisement and, and, and the competition that drives demand for services that, that satisfy the greed of some agent, agents within this uh, healthcare industry. And on the other hand, you have suppression of that demand that satisfies the greed of some other agents in the same industry. And patients are caught in the middle, oftentimes with their clinicians. There are things, for instance, uh, like they're being discussed today as if they were incredible uh, ways of, of um, solving this problem. One is the idea of linking the price of, for instance, medicines to their value. So if a medicine is a me-too drug that is not going to have a big impact, eh, then you, know, you shouldn't pay a lot of money for it. But if the medicine can save life, you should be pay, willing to pay a million dollars for a tablet. The problem with this approach, of course, is that when, when one looks back into me, in, in the history of medicine, the, the things that actually save lives, you know, uh, things like oral rehydration salts for kids with diarrhea. Imagine if you were to put a price tag on that of a million dollars. You know, what is, what is the ethics, what is the logic of actually letting those kids die because they can't afford, or their governments can't afford, or their population cannot afford uh, oral rehydration salts, or polio vaccines, or, you know, oxygen, or I don't know, whatever. So the logic that you have now, a new breakthrough cancer drug that can save lives of people who are destined otherwise to die, but you're going to put an enormous price tag that people have to jump over is completely nuts. It can, only, it can only be justified in an environment in which you imagine that the only reason people go to the lab to investigate new drugs is because they want to make money. <coughs> the only reason an investigator actually stays up at night is because they want to make money. The only, one, the only reason that clinician spends, you know, stays an extra hour or two hours to, to see the next patient is because they want to make that extra bonus. And just walking around hospitals and labs, we, we find people that are motivated by other things that this industry does not understand could be a motivation uh, for doing more. The idea of doing less, uh, that less is more, of choosing wisely. We have overused treatments. Patients, go and talk to their doctor and, and tell the doctor that you're, you don't want those services, you don't want those x-rays. So now we have patients uh, pitched against the person they hope that is going to help them to try to moderate the demand for services. So this same system is trying to now have the two people at the front line fight with each other to try to regulate how much healthcare is actually delivered instead of focusing on care. So we, we have an industry that does not care, that has corrupted its mission, has stopped caring, and we need to change this is for something that should, and that should should look like something that we all sign up for. We should look like careful and kind care. Now, some of us have thought that perhaps the way forward was technical. And we, we, we insisted on things like evidence-based medicine. You know, two principles, better evidence, more confident in the decision maker. Or that the evidence alone cannot tell you what to do and maybe sure decision making was a good thing. But unfortunately, it's been turned into a tool to standardize care under the penalty of quality programs through guidelines and quality improvement. So we have to rescue evidence-based me evidence medicine out of that into a tool that will help us take care of this patient on the basis of the best available science. And we need to make sure that the evidence that is produced is not produced by the companies that are actually studying their own products, funding their own studies to evaluate the, the safety and efficacy of their own products, and paying their fees to the FDA to get those products approved. It makes no sense. It protects no one from potential harm and unnecessary cost and unnecessary suffering. And shared decision making, we, we've discussed here, it's a conversation, it's, it's a dance, it's, 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 it's a way of arriving at care that makes you know, intellectual, emotional, and practical sense to people. But it's turned into a, into a tool to promote choice, into a tool that, that actually hopes to reduce consumption and reduce cost, which takes away from the idea of figuring out what this patient is about and caring for this patient, not for, not for patients like this. So we need to rescue shared decision making from the mindless application of decision aids, distribution of decision aids, and if you just use the decision aids, patient will choose less hip surgeries, less knee surgeries, and it will be good for everyone.
to the idea of what we saw in the video that, that we saw in some of some of us saw on the on the workshop, you know, of, of these cancer doctors struggling to, to do the dance, the right dance with their patient and missing. But we can now see that they, they miss and we can come back and try to do it better the next time. And it has nothing to do with the consumption of more or fewer resources. It has nothing to do with the issue of choice. It has to do with the issue of how do we address this patient's problem and how do we move forward. So how do we move forward? What is the is? What, what, what is the patient revolution, uh, what should the patient revolution seek? So we need to seek a system that is not fueled by greed, but one that is fueled by solidarity. This is a term that we've almost forgotten. But it's the idea that we are not in this alone, that we are in this together. And if one of us falls, we all fall. That if, that if for us to be successful, we cannot be successful leaving some of us behind. It, it's a simple idea. It's, it's a human idea. Uh, but it's somehow we've, we've decided that, no, 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 what we are, we are, is, we are individuals. And we need to, as individuals, succeed. And then if, if you can't, well, uh, too bad for you. There's a great analogy that Dawkins uh, developed, which is the analogy of trees. And so in a forest, you have these trees uh, trying, you know, growing, growing tall to try to catch the sun rays. And they're growing, growing, and try to grow tall. Some of them cannot grow tall, so they stay low, and they, they, get, they get shade, and then eventually they die. And, and then only a few trees get to be really tall and have access to, to the sun. And that's a good system for trees because trees can communicate with each other. They don't have no culture. They can't relate. They, they don't understand each other. We should do better than trees, right? <laughs> and yet we have a healthcare system in which we think competition is the way to improve, co improve care, reduce cost, and do everything right. And so we have two hospitals in the same town, both behind the same equipment, doing the same things, and advertising against each other to try to get the, the five people who are sick. And because the five people who are sick cannot fund the, the two hospitals, then they make everyone else sick so that they can actually meet their, their, their cost to pay for the robot or the new surgeon or whatever is needed. So we need to make sure that we don't get confused by the idea that, oh, competition improves everything. It, well, it, it, it maybe works for trees, but what about collaboration and realizing that if we're in this together, we can actually do better if we coordinate. In Hamilton, Ontario, um, the hospitals there they, they provide complementary services. So if you need you know, cardiovascular or cancer services, here are the ones that actually have narrowed that activity. But they don't have to put advertisements out to say, our emergency room is better than our emergency room. Ours it has a shorter uh, uh, delay. Let's make sure that the one that we have operates optimally. And we don't need competition for, to drive people to excellence. We just need a commitment to care to drive people to excellence. The, um, the idea is that the, the care should be based on relationships and love. And this, I mean, when was the last time you heard love discussed in the context of healthcare? But it's absolutely essential. Patients talk about loving their doctor. And doctors, clinicians, nurses, therapists, pharmacists, they have relationships with their patients that, that, are, that, that, that are emotional relationships, emotionally laden relationships. These relationships are important, particularly in chronic care. Because in chronic care, there's disappointment. And when you have disappointments, you fall back on something, and you fall back on relationships. Every time we have trouble with, with my kids, you know, my wife and I have to sit down and work through that. It's that relationship that we have that allows us to kind of, you know, roll with the punches and come back and deal with the next problem. And so if we don't have those relationships to fall back, and patients have a disappointment, what happens? Well, Lucy was telling us about the experience in China. When, you, when patients have a disappoint, disappointing outcome, they come back after their doctor, in some cases killing their doctor, in some cases just standing outside the office waiting to, to get some reparation and some explanation, some justice. Because there's no, no relationship to fall back. In this country, if you don't have a, a conversation and relationship-based uh, situation and somebody has a bad outcome, you get sued. None of these are, none of these solve any human problem. But there are the consequences of not having relationship and love as, as a structures to fall back on as part of your, of your care. There's a lot of resources that are spent on keeping people uh, compliant uh, with the uh, corporate principles. In a, in, a, in a system based on integrity, you don't need any of that. People can be left alone to innovate and, and come up with local solutions that deal with the problems of, the, of, of care that they, they experience without fear that they're going to deviate from the corporate line. Because instead of having a corporate line, which is artificial and imposed from, by PR from above, you have a line that's based on, on integrity. What is the right thing to do? And that keeps people 
uh, it's, like gra it's like gravity it keeps people together. Because the moment you see somebody acting in a low integrity way, right next to you, in, a, in an integrity based system, you can approach that person and say what you're doing is wrong. And we, you don't need police to come in and tell you that it's wrong because everybody knows what's wrong because it's based on integrity. And we need care to be elegant. And what, what is elegant care? Well, elegant care is, is the idea that we, are, we don't have to be rushed. We don't have to have an, a, you know, a hurried consultation. It's the idea that we can slow things down to the point where we can appreciate each other, where we can see the patient in high definition. Um, in at Mayo Clinic, the first dean of the medical school, uh, uh, Dr. Raymond Pruitt, um, gave a talk. Um, and he reflected on his years at Mayo Clinic, this is after he retired. And he reflected that when he first came to Mayo Clinic, he thought the clinic was elegant. And he, he said he thought it was elegant because the doctors could talk to each other about cases. They could, uh, at the end of the week, write down and reflect on the most difficult ones, even do research. That the discussions with patients were unhurried and doctors could get together around patient care and, and discuss together without any, any pressures. And he thought this was very elegant. And he was worried that, um, that because Mayo was committed to reducing costs and had become known nationally as a cost containment champion, that, it would, that the economic margin that was being improved in that way was at the expense of the margin of elegance. And that was the title of his talk, The Margin of Elegance. What's dramatic about that talk is the date. It was 1977. At the end of the day, if you have a system based on not on greed but on solidarity, on relationships and love, where integrity holds you together, where, it's, where the care is elegant and the care is timeless, you can actually do careful and kind care. That is based on the same things that we've been talking about here, evidence-based medicine, shared decision-making, minimally disruptive care. The forces that takes us from care for patients like this to the care for this patient, seeing this patient in high definition and then spending the time we need to spend because the duration of the time becomes an, an, an irrelevant way of allocating appointments or, or designing your day. It's the depth and thickness of the time that you spend together that begins to matter. And how do we make optimize our systems to optimize the thickness and the duration of time is an opportunity for innovation. It's not a matter of, of how many patients would you see but how, how, uh, how deep the conversation can become. At this point, I'd like to switch gears and, and read a little bit so you can get a sense of what this book is about um, from one of the chapters, which is called Cathedrals. It's a penultimate chapter on the, on the book. And um, I'll get to illustrate a little bit with the, with the slides. So, um, cathedrals are expressions of what people believe to be true and important. Uh, families dedicated generations to build them. My own great-grandfather belonged to the tradition of stonemasons who built European cathedrals. One gets the sense that to build these massive structures, communities have to cast concerns for money, effort, or time in a scale commensurate with their ambitions. Not that there was no constraints. Barcelona's Sagrada Familia Cathedral, which is on the picture, remains under construction, mired by Gaudí's complex design, by civil war that destroyed much of his original drawings and made fighters of his workers, and by recurrent economic crisis. The modern construction cranes are as much part of his profile today as are the towers projecting this breathtaking building to the sky. But those cranes are there, against the odds, finishing their job. Inside, the light dances between the columns as Gaudí laughs at our modern efficiencies, our cost effectiveness, our inattentions, and our hurries. When things are worth doing, when we're building cathedrals, or when we're caring for each other, time, more precisely time's duration, is not the measure. Like cathedrals, patient care must be timeless. My favorite, um, my favorite museum in the world exhibits the words of Auguste Rodin. It is a rather quaint place in Paris, uh, filled with sculptures, my favorite art medium. My attention is drawn powerfully to the hands in Rodin's work, rough, struggling with prominent bony landmarks and contracted bulging muscles holding energy and power in them. Those are not the hands in the 1908 masterpiece, The Cathedral, which is on the slide. Two right hands emerge from the marble on opposite sides. As they come toward each other, they reach upward to create a space between them. In The Cathedral, two people come close, their hands calm and soft. 
The attention is to the space these hands form and contain. That space is free of marble, free of everything really, making room for all else. If the sculpture had not subtracted material from the marble center, he would not have created that space and the meaning of the piece would have been unintelligible. The fingers made the spires, the hands made the walls, but the space made this the cathedral. Such a cathedral only exists as the hands of two people collaborate to form it, the space lasting for as long as these two people care to form it. So I have argued that industrial healthcare misses the, misses the patient, cares by accident, and is routinely cruel. We need to replace this with a system that notices each person and focuses its know-how and technologies to respond elegantly to her or his situation. This work will depend on bringing patient and clinician together and then removing all friction from their work, quieting all distractions in the hallowed space of the clinical encounter. In this way, sculpting reflects well the work of a patient revolution. It is chipping away at what is not contributing to the care of patients. The main act to bring a patient revolution to fruition may be the fostering of undisturbed encounters in which time can deepen as unhindered hands noticing each other come closer to care. We must build timeless cathedrals of careful and kind care. A patient revolution cannot be effective without fundamentally changing the ways in which we live, in addition to the ways that make a healthcare consumer of everyone and make industrial healthcare the patient's exclusive answer. One of the most moving pictures I have used in my presentations is that of a castell. A castell is a human construction, a feat of verticality achieved by a pyramid of men, women, and children of all ages, abilities, and constitutions. Many people form the base of the castell, concentric circles tightly connected to keep the towering castle erect and to cushion any falls. A stem rises from the base. A cathedral is a castell with eight levels. Five people or castellers constitute each of the first five levels. The next two levels are formed by three and two people, and the last one by just one person, often a child. While impressive in the heights they can achieve, I use the picture of the base of the castell. This is the picture because it is at the base that a particularly moving image forms in concentric, many in concentric circles around one. This picture allows me to speak of the societies we're building, societies that alienate, exclude the weak, the weak and infirm, and make it harder for those most unlucky to realize their capacity, to be and become who they dream, and to do what their spirit demands. Societies that imagine individuals dreaming and thriving as if success were all self-made and self-accomplished. As if the only difference were that the winner was smarter and worked harder than the loser. <clears throat> Castells are monuments to a radically different vision. One of solidarity. One in which the difference is that the winner received more help. Castells are the triumph of collective imagination realized. As they grow, castells are pulled down by their mass. When the castell falls, we all absorb the fall and distribute the pain. Care elevates the caregiver and the clinician, but it also weighs and burdens them. A well-built castell, like a well-built society, distributes the benefits and burdens of care, contributes to the capacity of everyone to reach their potential, trusts members to contribute their best, softens the falls, and is made resilient by the tight weaving of relationships. The work of a patient revolution must transcend disassembling the healthcare industry. It must partner with others to transform the societies in which we live so that they can contribute to our health. Patient care is just one reflection of this capacity for careful and kind care. Along with cathedrals of care in which hands come together, we must also build castells of solidarity in which hands hold each other. This castell is almost finished. The last one, a precious child, is climbing to its top. Her parents, holding on to their fellow castellers at the base, trusting everyone else, await nervously for the music to signal their daughter's arrival to the summit. They are enveloped by a deep sense of care for and about each other. They are surrounded by love. As she climbs, that little girl will not feel lonely. As she stands at the top, she will not think she got there because of her own effort and courage. For if she were just to look down, she would see everyone in the village, her whole world, holding her, raising her, 
helping her touch the moon. So this is the idea, is to build that image. And the patient revolution is one way of achieving that. We're trying to do this by promoting shared decision making and better conversations in the clinical setting, working in, in the community to prepare patients to get those conversations when they go into healthcare, having meetings in people's living rooms to discuss how might they respond to the demands of healthcare and have dialogues in towns that are trying to have conversations with the healthcare systems that are uh, trying to care for them. Uh, small transformations, one conversation after another until we get a system that cares, that is able to provide careful and kind care. So the question is, of course, what to do, because the, the task is too large. So I'll finish with the last bit of the book. Um, we can all take two, at least two steps. First is to stop accepting healthcare as an industry and your healthcare as the product. And second is to start a conversation. So maybe use the language of patient care and see what happens. I trust that our cost is just and that we can change the way people think and act with our words. I think we can start a movement and surprise ourselves. Like building cathedrals, it may take generations to completely reach our goal. I trust that our, that our work, like those temples, will stand as evidence that we at this point in our history, carried. Thank you. Maybe there's five minutes for questions or comments. Yeah, I, I don't know. Um, <laughs> um, maybe, maybe this doesn't start with the top. Maybe we don't. Uh, so the people that are at the top at the moment are the people that have learned to play the game of the industry. So perhaps those are the people that have the most to lose if the, games, if the, the rules of the game change. So perhaps that's not the place to start. And I, I suspect there are people that are trying to operate at a level of policy. There are people trying to operate at a level of leadership. They're trying to change things for the better. Um, uh, and that's, that's, that's one approach. And the question is, are there other approaches? And what about those of us who don't have a leadership position, who are not investors, who are not, who are not in, the pay, in, in a payer environment, who are not playing that game? What, what, what do we have to do? And so I think, from, from my standpoint, it, once you start paying attention to the language, you start realizing where things are going. And you start, I think, questioning what comes up right now? Where things are being justified on the basis of oh, the healthcare system is the health, the environment is changing. We need to adapt. To adapt, we're going to do this. And obviously, well, you want to adapt, right? That's what smart animals do when 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 your genes do when the situation changes, right? Otherwise, you get extinct. So it's a very it's a very primal uh, 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 plea, right? The leaders are asking us to adapt or peril. And so, how are you, how are you going to argue with that? That's, that's an unacceptable language, right? So we need to think about, okay, what are you asking us to do? How is that going to affect our ability to provide careful and caring care? How are we going to be, are we going to be able to see people elegantly? Are we going to be able to see people individually? Are we going to be able to see people in high definition? If the answer is, well, we can't afford that anymore, then we're not doing care anymore. That you can go on with your industry that I'm stepping off this train. Um, clinicians don't, are not empowered to do that at the moment, in part because their likelihood depends on the system as is. So that's why this is called the patient revolution, because I don't think I'm expecting professionals to lead. I'm expecting professionals to follow what citizens are going to do with the system. So that, that was my non-answer to your question. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Um, I'm curious about the 
Any other comments or questions? An easier question? Right. <laughs> yes, it's right. not a question, but I, I think in response to that, but for some of us, you need what's called a clarion call. And that is putting it in a, you know, it's like I read the book. And I said, yeah, I could have written this book over the years, but I haven't. And I thought that. So you need someone as yourself to be whatever you may think of that, that it gives a voice to this that allows us to begin the conversations, to think about who we connect with, to create, whether it be the right term or not, a social movement that starts from the ground up. And that's where I think the power of this is by the language. And in this day and age of this country, we need something like this to counter all the negativity that's going on. So I think this is really a chance for us to call to what's the best of all of us and to start that conversation uh, and be willing to take that on. I, this has, as a retired individual, this has propelled me to think, you know, there's something more to do. And your words have sort of inspired me to think about what I might do in some small way to contribute to that. I don't know that yet, but it's given me the urge to say there's more that needs to be done. It's a clarion call. And that's where I think it's, a, that's how I look at that book. So, so thank you. And one of the things that I think is important to pick up is that this use of language is by no means a, a light uh, weapon. Yes. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, so both from Pablo Brito and Marlene Quinn and I are not here today, but uh, we, we wrote a, we were asked to write an editorial for Jam on shared decision. And it, it's, a, it's a little feisty editorial. But we wrote about the dance. We wrote about love. We wrote about this thing. And the editor edited those words out. They talked about cost and healthcare utilization and so on. I can't, no, it, I mean, I, I, we, with our group, we did a little mentorship meeting, and I showed them the two copies. So the, 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 language, is, the language was not the one that fit the journal of medicine, right? So, so small things, if, if you stand everything you write in your presentations, in the way you talk to colleagues, if you change the language of the conversation, what will happen? This is why we think conversations are so powerful as a strategy for, for the revolution. We didn't talk about pitchforks. We didn't talk about you know uh, going out and declaring the place on strike. We talked about conversations. And it sounds such a nonviolent uh, you know, strategy. And well, yeah, because we're carrying people. We're not going to start you know, producing violence. But there's going to be friction. And the friction, is, I think, starts by choosing the words that you use to communicate with each other. You're raising your hand, or you're pointing at your pen? I'm raising my hand. All right, go for it. <laughs> so I'm imagining the frame of never events, but I'm extending it to never words. And I would like you to give me five words that the next time I go to see a health care something, I, if those words are used, I say, stop. I don't want those words used in my my vision. Uh, that's a challenge for all of us. You want to offer a few? Compliance. Compliance is a good one. Yeah. Compliance. Huh? Patients as clients. Clients. No. Although that is actually a, a disciplinary issue for some people, right? So yeah. they, they actually, by discipline, they call it clients. But consumers or customers may be extensions of that. No shows. No shows. Providers. Providers. Patients. Patients. That's interesting, right? Patients as a, as, a, as a role, right? Uh, yeah. Patients as a role. Uh, I actually love patients in one way, and that is if, if a patient comes in for care, they're going to get care. But a patient that is in another role, in another moment, does not need to continue to be a patient if they're not there for care. So we can, we can, we can that. argue about that later. Yes, very good. <laughs> but the point is that we're having a conversation about it. That's the point. And that we're moving forward to try to actually make patients the center of the system, not a subject of the system or, or a victim. Say yes. Difficult. Sorry, difficult. difficult. Yeah, we heard this. You know, it was this morning or yesterday. Yeah, difficult yesterday. patients versus difficult situations. Yeah. Yes. Cost effective. Cost effective. Cost effective is a systems issue, right? You cannot talk about cost effective on an individual patient basis. I'm not going to give you this because it's not cost effective. Really. So, so it's not difficult to actually come up with a dictionary of things that we, you know, we shouldn't be using. Or perhaps the opposite, right? It shouldn't be difficult to come up with a dictionary of things that actually create the, the right kind of thinking. The first word on this book is Orwell. And uh, this is somewhat intentional. Orwell, in, in the book 1984, has an appendix. The appendix is a dictionary. Mm -hmm. And the whole point of the dictionary was that if you change the language, 
you, you, you actually can dominate a whole, a whole society. You can change that society. It, it, we have an enormous tool in front of us, you know, the language that we use in the conversations that we have. So yeah, I think there could be a dictionary of, of careful and kind care that can follow up on this. Any other thoughts? Yes. So another great thought leader out there in the world, like yourself, it's true. <laughs> this is true. Moving okay, on. So, um, so Don Berwick stood on the stage at the forum in Florida two years ago in front of 5,000 mostly docs and nurses and used the word love. Mm -hmm. And before so, him, Don Ebedian actually had actually, <coughs> with the Armenian guy that had developed some of the basic signs of, of uh, quality improvement, had actually said that the, the, the scent, the, what was it, the, the Somebody should help me. The, 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 the secret of, of, um, of, of the, the, the center thing of quality is love. Is love for the patient. Yeah. The essence, thank you. So that's, that's a very strong um, leadership partner resource yeah. with the work that you're doing as well. That is something so he's, to... He's uh, said that he's going to mention the book in his forum presentation this year, so we'll see what happens. I bet he will. Yeah.